Before we get into the technical side of this forgotten craft, let's start with the question that pulls every serious historian straight into the trench. Why did medieval builders trust wooden foundations, posts, beams and walls in conditions where modern lumber wouldn't last a season? When people today hear about rotting timber, they assume it was just part of medieval life. But when you start digging through archaeological layers of Norse shipyards, Slavic fortifications, Alpine farmsteads, or even English causeways, you keep stumbling upon the same puzzle. Wood that should have rotted centuries ago, but didn't. And not by accident. These people didn't just get lucky with climate or soil. They engineered that durability on purpose. And here's the part that hooks every researcher who has ever handled both ancient timber and modern lumber side by side. The older stuff feels different. It sounds different when tapped. It weighs differently. And when you trace the pattern across Europe, Asia, and even parts of early colonial America, you find the same trick repeated over and over by independent cultures who arrived at the same solution. Stabilize wood before it ever touches water, soil, wind, or insects. They did it not with chemicals or pressure-treating machines, but with timing, controlled decay, mineral exchange, fire, and, most importantly, patience. The kind we forget exists in construction today. So let's break it down clearly and practically, because this is one of those medieval technologies that actually does transfer directly into survival, homesteading, or long-term off-grid building. The first key was harvesting wood at the correct season. Medieval carpenters weren't cutting trees whenever they felt like it. They understood that sap content determines whether wood rots quickly or hardens into something close to natural composite material. In northern and central Europe, the rule was simple. Cut timber in the dead of winter when the sap is at its lowest. Sap-rich wood is essentially sugar water, and sugar water attracts fungus, bacteria and insects. Sap-poor wood behaves differently. It dries clean, shrinks predictably, and doesn't ferment inside the fibres. This is why many medieval beams, especially in Germanic and Nordic regions, lasted centuries without chemical treatment. For anyone applying this today in a survival or bushcraft setting, the technique is straightforward. If you're gathering wood for long-term use, tool handles, stakes, load-bearing beams, or anything touching ground, harvest in winter or from dead standing dry trees. The reduction in sap alone can double or triple lifespan. The second key was water soaking and mineral saturation. One of the most a uh, counterintuitive medieval tricks was soaking wood in running water for weeks or even months. Viking shipbuilders used this method, and so did Eastern European fort builders. Submerging fresh-cut timber leeches out the remaining sugars, tannins, and soft compounds that fungi really love. Running water does what modern pressure treating attempts to mimic. It flushes the wood and leaves behind stronger cellulose and lignin. But in many regions, the water itself contributed minerals. Iron-rich streams, limestone-fed rivers, or clay-heavy ponds. This mineral exchange literally filled microscopic voids in the timber, turning it, well, partially stone-like. Archaeologists excavating Slavonic river forts have pulled up oak beams from the 900s that felt closer to fossil than, you know, lumber. 
If you wanted to apply this today, say for building an outdoor workbench defensive stakes or a long-term fence line, the method is uncomplicated. You just submerge the cut timber in a cold creek and weigh it down with rocks or logs. Leave it for at least two weeks, or, you know, as long as two months, if you want maximum hardness. Then dry it slowly out of direct sun. This soaking and seasoning cycle is responsible for some of the longest-lasting wooden structures ever built. The third key was controlled charring to resist moisture, insects, and rot. Japanese builders still use this today under the name Shosugiban, but medieval Europe practiced its own version long before it was documented in Asia. Builders would lightly char the outer surface of posts and beams before installing them. The principle is simple. The outer carbon layer is hydrophobic, insect-resistant and inhospitable to fungi. It also seals the wood without preventing internal moisture from leaving. Charred foundations have been found in medieval wells, bridges and underground supports. Some are nearly blackened into a shell, but still structurally sound, centuries later. To replicate this in a practical off-grid setting, set your wood on stones or hang it on a green pole rack. Rotate it slowly over a fire or, you know, use a torch. You only want a few millimetres of char, not deep burns. Brush off loose soot and oil the surface with tallow, linseed, or even birch, tar. This method is excellent for anything exposed to the elements, shed posts, tool handles, trap components, or small building frames. The fourth key was layering wood with natural preservatives from the environment. Clay was a favourite, especially in Slavic and Baltic regions. Clay plaster absorbs moisture swings, blocks oxygen and stabilises temperature, all things that rot hates. In Alpine and Scandinavian regions, pitch and pine tar were applied repeatedly to exterior beams. Farmers collected tar in pits and brushed it onto barns every few seasons, creating a waterproof and antifungal barrier. In an extreme survival scenario, or, you know, even a long-term homestead build, these solutions are still available. Clay can be mixed with straw and applied by hand. Birch bark can be wrapped around posts as a moisture shield. Pine tar can be made in a pit kiln using resinous stumps. These are not romantic reconstructions. They work exactly as they did 500 years ago. The biggest takeaway here is that medieval wood preservation wasn't about products. It was about processes. They created durability by changing the internal chemistry and external environment of the wood before decay ever started. Modern lumber mills, well, they skip all of this. They cut in any season, dry too fast, remove too little sap, and rely on chemical pressure treating that still fails after a decade. But anyone with basic survival skills can recreate medieval durability. Harvest correctly, soak patiently, char deliberately. Seal with materials nature gives you for free. It's a method that outlived empires for a reason. If this breakdown gave you something new to think about, and especially if you plan to try these methods yourself, make sure you subscribe to Warfield Survival and share this guide with another historian or survivalist who will appreciate forgotten engineering done right.